After 30 years adrift, Jaguar has emerged from the wilderness. Jaguar is back to reaffirm its racing pedigree at Le Mans. In the 50s, the cars from Coventry found fame and world stardom, with five wins in seven races. In 1957, they came first, second, third, fourth, and sixth. And then they vanished. The days of the Brill Cream Boys had ended. The Le Mans 24 Hours is the world's most glamorous endurance test. It is a car race with a cabaret. All drivers at the far end of the pit to take part in the presentation of drivers. Jaguar's return is a homecoming. A homecoming with a difference. The British backed team are all American action men from Virginia. For them, racing in Europe is new. At home, they're veterans. But here they're still wet behind the earplugs. Undaunted owner and boss of the American racing shop is driver, perfectionist, 
Bob Tullius. My mother told me that my father had a gasoline fanny. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but uh, he was always a car enthusiast. I was a car enthusiast. He was never a racer, but uh, I think he had a tendency to be one if he had had a chance. I um, grew up in a neighborhood where everybody was cars and uh, everything was uh, speed. I played a lot of football and baseball and that sort of thing, but I slowly gravitated to cars and, and uh, found that um, it was truly my first love in life. We have access to their computer. We have uh, access to their testing facilities. And we have at least two people who work full time working with Group 44. And the cooperation has been magnificent. John Baker is in charge of marketing the American Jaguar team. We hit Paris on Sunday morning. We spent four hours seeing the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower and came right here and been working ever since. do it or uh, do it uh, half of it for what they earn and the other half because they love the sport Lanky Fouché was a mechanic with Air Force One when Nixon was president today his allegiance is to Jaguar we'd like to achieve a, a good finish with both cars here we of course like to win uh, we're coming in and playing another man's ball game, really. And in order to, we, you've got to come and enjoy the spectacle once and, and go through the rigors of, of what it takes to compete in the European racing scene. And we hope to accomplish that this year. Ideally, we'd like to have both cars finish. You know, finishing Le Mans itself is, is quite a mark. And to expect a victory in the very first year is, is I think, uh, asking for a miracle. Some people call it a learning experience. Uh, that's somewhat what it is also. But uh, we'd like to get in, get our feet wet, get the feel of what's going on here, and, and come back and win it some year in the future, hopefully next. For Jaguar, the 70s were a dark decade. Under the crushing weight of a government-controlled monolith, the company's identity was erased. Jaguar signs and motifs were torn down. The Jaguar name forbidden. Morale, along with sales, plummeted. And reliability became a laughingstock. The company seemed lost. In 1980, John Egan arrived. He came with an olive branch in one hand, a hatchet in the other. His brief, save Jaguar. When I got here, I found everybody on strike. Um, and there was uh, a, a great deal of principle involved.
So I was really drawn in very, very quickly, uh, having to work for and fight for survival right from the start. My arrival signaled the fact, A, that I was going to come here and do my best, but also that the company, BL, was willing to rebuild Jaguar as an integrated company again. And also, my views were that we should seek more and more independence to run the company as fitted Jaguar and its customer and employee requirements. And it was on that basis that they returned. They, they, they returned because they thought that we might be able to recreate Jaguar towards an independent future. So there's a great deal of, of hope in people's hearts when they actually came back to work. But the first thing that we did was to try and reduce the workforce to the level we could afford to pay. We were just simply running out of money. And we reduced the workforce from about 10,500 people down to 7,000. And if we hadn't have done that, we just simply would have run out of money and we wouldn't have uh, survived. <laughs> now we've created something like 2,000 new jobs. But the productivity is, has almost trebled. It's gone up from some, I think, 1.3 cars per employee back in 1980. Uh, to something like 3.5 today. If uh, people always feel that uh, the company is actually uh, a thinking and reasonable company, then I pe people will often forget some of the minor niggles that occur in life. Uh, but if they believe that uh, they have to uh, uh, tear concessions out of... Uh, out of a, uh, an unforgiving and, and, and unthoughtful management, then it, every small niggle is, is, is exploded into, uh, into a major problem. What we've tried to create is an environment where the, uh, the, everybody in the company can have common objectives. That's why we spend so much time communicating with the workforce and also feel that they can affect the way the company is run. Seventy percent of the people who can afford to buy our cars in the world live in the United States. So uh, we've therefore got to make sure that the job we do is correct for those customers in the United States. So we have, uh, we treat uh, the US market basically as our domestic marketplace. Always in the back of my mind, uh, being privatized as a separate company was necessary for our survival. And I don't think it was ever possible to run a company like ours tacked on the end of a much larger uh, company. Um, this has got to create a culture and an environment of its own which, which is quite different in its decision making and risk taking to a, a volume car maker. One of the few British interlopers in the American Jaguar camp is John Watson. Well, I think Le Mans is, as an event, in a, a unique race. Uh, I mean, although there are other 24-hour races, Le Mans is still something special. It isn't just a race, it is an event. And I think that there's always a certain amount of um, expectation before the race begins. But then, really, like any race, once you've done your first driving stint, it's just like another race, and you get into the swing and into the flow, and I think it's very important to be able to establish a nice comfortable pace and routine throughout the race rather than like a Grand Prix which is really a sprint from the flag fall to flag fall. I've been walking through the pits and, and uh, I walk into a motorhome and people say, oh John, how are you? Nice to see you. 
and really current at Grand Prix racing, it's so intense and so much at stake that really there's not very much hospitality and uh, it does seem to be becoming more and more serious. But here at Le Mans, it's a much more, it's almost carnival-like, it's a festival. And you can walk around the pits, walk into other people's motorhomes and, and talk to people that maybe you haven't seen for a long time. And it is a much more relaxed atmosphere than a Grand Prix.
Jaguar, the Supercat, ran with the best in Europe. Out of 53 starters, they were third fastest down the straight, and for much of the race, they were in the top five. For one short lap, Glory beckoned elusively as Jaguar stole the lead. But Le Mans lived up to its reputation as a heartbreaker. After two and a half thousand miles, with just three hours out of 24 remaining, Jaguar hopes were torn to shreds by a nail. Wappenbury Hall in Warwickshire, there's an air of stability and a sense of ordered refinement. Values and standards of bygone times are mirrored by its inhabitants and servants. As a symbol of success, Wappenbury is impressive, but of more interest, perhaps, is the fact that for half a century, Wappenbury Hall has been home to a man of exceptional business flair and drive, an achiever who, through sheer graft and persistence, made one of the world's great car companies, the company Jaguar, the man behind the creation, Sir William Lyons.
1921, Sir William was just plain Billy Lyons, and he was enchanted by a young girl called Greta. I think it was at a school friend's party, a dance. And um, it was one of those silly dances where you exchanged labels and danced with whoever had your counterpart. And presumably, Sir William saw me and found the, the counterpart to me and asked me for the first dance. <laughs> and he couldn't dance at all, it was terrible. <laughs> but after that, we met at various times, and the first time he asked me to go out with him was on pillion riding on the back of his bike. And I had to meet him at a certain place. And I remember my parents said, why doesn't he call for you here? And I, he explained afterwards the bike would only start at the top of a hill going down, so that was why we had to meet there. <laughs> he was a very dashing rider. As a young man, he was very much taken with a sidecar made by his neighbour. Eventually, he cajoled William Wormsley into a business partnership. He made a sidecar, which I thought was very good indeed. He, was, he made one or two for friends, and I thought, well, he ought to do something with this. And so eventually he agreed. His father persuaded him to, as a matter of fact. And um, so we each had 500 pounds guaranteed for the business uh, by our respective fathers. And... Um, we started with a thousand pounds. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had to wait a little time if, before we could do this partnership business because I wasn't 21. So we had to wait to, 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 before we signed the contract, which we did. That was all right, and then we went on from there. The fledgling firm was called Swallow. The embryonic entrepreneurs paid themselves six pounds a week each. Connie Tether joined Swallow Sidecars in 1928. She was only just 17. There were a lot of people out of work. And uh, when I saw the advertisement for Swallow Coach Building Company, I hurried to see Cocker Street and find out where it was. Uh, inside the factory building was the office on the left. It was uh, timber to about desk height, and then glass so that people coming out in the office could see the people outside. Mr Lyons called me into the office later on, and uh, he gave me a test. He dictated a letter, which I had to type, and also tested me in uh, uh, decimals and percentages. These I found very easy. And uh, I was very relieved when he said he, he, I could start and he agreed on a wage of 10 shillings a week. I felt very frightened at that first interview. In fact, I was always uh, very timid of Sir William. By the time Connie arrived, the company had ventured into making car bodies. I bought, I bought an Austin 7 and... Um then I decided to make a body for it. And um, eventually arranged with Henleys to see it. Bertie Henley, a successful London distributor, certainly took notice. His reaction startled young Lyons. He gave me an order for 500. And I didn't know what to do because it's impossible that we could produce such a tremendous number. However, I'd, we moved to Coventry in that time, by that time, so things were stuck in, in Birmingham and round about Wolverhampton and so on. I got some more men in and we got down to it and we were producing 12 a week. We jumped up to 12 a week within a few weeks. And before long, we were at a rate of meeting the demand. Lance flair for design transformed a boxy Austin into a cheeky little car with big curves. The Austin Swallow just wouldn't be ignored. 
Other cars to be swallowed were Morris, Fiat, Woolsey, Swift and Standard. For Connie, the halcyon days at Swallow were very much Blackpool. And I can vividly remember the buskers uh, standing outside the little guest houses, which were on the way to the, to the factory. Uh, they used to be playing uh, My Blue Heaven and uh, Bye Bye Blackbird, saxophones and trumpets. And the people on holiday were probably having breakfast in the bay windows, sometimes with the windows open if they open if the uh, morning was fine and they would throw pennies out to them but uh, it always set the morning off to a good start when i heard that 1931 was the year of the swallow sensation the 300 pound car with a 1000 pound look it was called the ss ss was soon more than just a name in 1933 ss cars limited was formed Two years later, it went public. It was very low, with long bonnets, very sporty looking, but was considered to be not quite the thing to drive. Uh, however, it appeared on the Daily Mail, front page, full, 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 full page, the car of the year, 395 pounds. And um, we went to the show when we were very successful in getting number of orders. In fact, we, we, never made it, we never made a loss, the company, not since the first day. Swallow Sidecars was on the way out. So was his partner, William Wormsley. He used to make engines, little toy engines and things, and he'd, he'd make the paint shop stop so he could paint his, his engines. And of course, it used to cause a lot of, lot of difference between us. He was much older, and he, I think he felt he didn't want to spend the rest of his life, whereas my husband's view was always the future, getting on further and further and further. And he didn't want to go. He wanted to just enjoy the rest of his life. He used to come in my office, and I used to say, oh, how long is it going to take? And he'd talk for half an hour about uh, nothing and, and <laughs> try and get, get rid of him, <laughs> which I eventually did. Well, the hay looks as if it's going to be a bit funny, doesn't it? Not a very good crop. No. Um, Still, we can't expect it with the weather we've had. Uh, will you be making s silage? Oh, we've made silage. Have we? Mm -hmm. I didn't see. Yes. William Haynes wanted to be a surgeon, but his family couldn't afford it. He ended up in the motor trade and met and married Dutch. In 1935, Haynes was offered a job with SS Cars after a most careful appraisal by Lyons. Lyons, as it, with everything he did, he was most meticulous. I had about oh, at least half a dozen interviews with him. And uh, finally, um, he, on April the 5th, 1935, he gave me the job. I don't think he knew exactly what he wanted me to do, but he, he wanted to start an engineering department. He hadn't been satisfied with a lot of things on the chassis and that he was having from um, uh, Standard, and he wanted someone that could influence them in the way that he wanted a car made. Within six months of his arrival, a new model was launched. Dealers overestimated its selling price by 250 pounds. The car was an SS with a difference. It was an SS Jaguar. He was a dynamic personality, even in those days. He knew what he wanted, and he told you. By 1945, SS was not a very good idea. The name SS, for obvious reasons, was a post-war liability. It was scrapped. Jaguar was at last a make in its own right. 1948 was the genesis of Jaguar's racing pedigree. The 130 mile an hour XK120 marked the arrival of the Super Cat. And I uh, said, well, what about building a car for Le Mans. 
He said, okay. And it took us all our time to get these three cars ready for Le Mans. Uh, he didn't think we were going to complete them. And so before he went, he went to America about six weeks before Le Mans race. He, uh, before he went, he put in hand three specially light 120s, because I think he hadn't, wasn't at all sure that I should get these completed. But my God, we all worked all hours that God sent. And two cars were finished well in time. The third one was assembled on the way over in the boat. Jaguar roared through the 50s with great victories at Le Mans, and almost overnight, Lahn's company was famous. The results were immediate. In 1954, more Jaguar cars were sold in the USA than any other foreign make except Volkswagen. Anybody who was anybody wanted a Jaguar. Lan's only son was killed in a car crash in 1955. Like Ferrari and Bugatti, he suddenly became a car maker without an heir. But life and work, inseparable as they were to Lan's, went on. Exports boomed. Mr. Bill Lan's became Sir William. The company rode the crest of a wave of 60s optimism, and the world had a love affair with Jaguar.
has been his life, really. I mean, he's uh, one-track-minded, certainly. Always work, work, work. Um, otherwise, he's perfectly normal. <laughs> 